Hello and welcome to Faith and Friends. We have several special guests on today's show, so we're going to jump right into that very quickly. But first, a reminder to you, now is the time to donate those auction items to the TV44 auction. This is a friend, but it'll only be a friend for our summer. He could be your friend very soon. You can bring your items Monday through Thursday between the hours of 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. or call if you have questions. You can make appointments Friday as well. We're looking for individuals with timeshares who might be interested in donating a week as one of our getaway trips. You can call Jennifer for more information. Speaking of Jennifer, she'll be with us in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at our scripture, which continues with our theme of brotherly kindness. We go to Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my first firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So if you have a thousand rivers of oil, that's not what the Lord requires. The Lord does not require a year old calf. The Lord doesn't even require a carved buffalo. <laughs> the Lord requires your love. The Lord requires your, for, your repentance. That's what he requires. That's all that he, you need for forgiveness is the love of Jesus Christ. And brotherly kindness can be extended to more than just our human friends. Many of you experience a strong bond with your pets. And recently, the Allen County Humane Society held a special blessing of the animals. Matt Finkel has more. About two dozen pet owners gathered at the Humane Society of Allen County last week to participate in the 15th annual Blessing of the Animals. It's an event that is well received by the public. It gives um, animal lovers an opportunity to celebrate their, their uh, bond with their uh, companion animals and also for us to celebrate the animals that we share our lives and our, our earth with. Animals, of course, play a major role throughout the Bible, and it was meaningful for Pastor Ryan Roser to conduct the blessings. It's our job to take care of the animals. Um, as stewards of this planet, God even says in, in Genesis that we are stewards or trustees, and we should uh, maintain the animals in a uh, loving manner. Those that are righteous will be loving to their animals. The candlelight vigil gives us an opportunity to remember animals that have lost their lives throughout the year, not only in the state of Ohio, but across the country due to overpopulation or abandonment. We also investigate a large number of animal cruelty cases, and some of those animals do not make it. So the candlelight vigil is a way to, to remember those animals, and also it's a moment of hope for the animals that need our help. The Humane Society of Allen County, which is operated by the Ohio SPCA, is dedicated to eliminating animal cruelty, offering shelter along with locating lifelong homes. Community support goes a long way towards maintaining that mission. The number one need we have is always donations. Um, the Ohio SPCA and, and Humane Society is not government funded. We're not connected to any national SPCA. And um, of course, you know, vet care and feed and all of our medicine that we we purchase every month runs into the thousands and thousands of dollars. So the number one need is um, monetary donations. And then we always are gracious with anybody when anybody comes in with things like bleach and paper towels and laundry detergent, things that we can keep the animals environment and blankets clean with. In Lima, I'm Matt Finkel. So what is your definition of the word vow? We hear about vows in marriage. Maybe here or there you might hear it other places, but what does it really mean to keep your vows? How important are they? Do they even matter? Well, the answer is yes, and we're gonna explore that a little bit more today. We have David and Tracy Sellers with us here from Vows to Keep Ministries. And before we even jump into this topic, the word vows is in your name, Vows to Keep. How did you, how did you come up with that title? Well, it was something that was derived from the fact that we recognized when we got married that we made a promise to God. We made a promise to each other. And uh, when you got married, I su suspect it was something very similar. Yeah, a lot of people make vows and don't necessarily realize that they're making those vows truly to a covenant-keeping God. Mm -hmm. And biblically, we are called to make vows that we're going to keep. So that's where our name came from. 
it's a choice that we made. It's not something that she forces me into, um, but it's a choice I have to keep making over and over and over every day. And these vows that are really a promise of a lifetime, the world that we live in and our sin nature tells us that they're optional, that what we said at the altar to one another is really just based on performance, that as soon as you mess up, now all of a sudden it's a legal agreement that I can get out of if I get lawyers and a judge involved. We were having a conversation with a gentleman here a few weeks ago and he pointed out the fact that I feel like my marriage is probably very temporary. And he, he said, once my kids get grown up and they're moved out of the house, I probably won't have a marriage anymore. Mm. We hear that a lot. And on some levels, it's, I guess understandable that our kids have a great dependency on us and we recognize that we've made a, a vow to them to raise them but God I think really holds us accountable to the fact that we've made a vow first to him as Christians that should be our first vow he's our first love and then comes our marriage vow and then comes our kids vows right the, 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 the desire to take care of them but it's it's in that order that we really have to do that yeah definitely the word covenant is not something that is probably used or understood as much right. as it was in the past. You read the Old mm -hmm. Testament and you recognize covenants were, I mean, they were as, yeah. Yeah. they were a big deal if you broke them. Absolutely. But really today we're in that same situation. Mm -hmm. We are under a covenant and we start with God and it's a covenant that we're not to break. Even in the most difficult moments where you think you cannot stand that guy or that girl any longer, any longer. God still yeah. is saying you made this promise. Yes. Because when you get two people living under the same roof that are both sinners, one of them's going to mess up pretty quick. Just and one? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got the choice to make. Am I going to keep my covenant to them in spite of their fall? But a covenant marriage says to the Lord first, God, I'm going to love this man through your love, with your love. And not only when he does everything just right, but I'm going to serve him and be your hands and feet in his life even when they break their promise to me. Yeah, when, we, when we keep our covenant to our spouse when they failed, I mean, that's basically you're following through with, with, with what scripture calls you to. You're applying the, the verses of the Bible mm -hmm. that I think compel us to, to, to keep these vows. We're also responding often in forgiveness, right? That, yeah. that becomes our reaction. It has to become a reaction in order to keep that covenant which is so important to do. When we follow through on these commitments, we basically are keeping our vows. It's very simple. I want to read from Psalms 116. This is starting in verse 12. It says, What shall I return to the Lord for all of his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people, and especially in the presence of this marriage. Mm -hmm. God made a covenant to his people, just like a husband would make a covenant to a wife. And in Jeremiah 31, we read, it says, they, they broke my covenant even though I was a husband to him. I mean, God's actually saying, this is personal to me. In Hosea, Israel is even referred to as a harlot, a cheating wife who's worshiping other gods. Israel, we hear about Israel, but we don't always apply it to our marriage. Mm -hmm. so, so how does Israel, how can we look at these scriptures and say, this is a picture of God's marriage with us? or our marriage with each other. Sure, so if you read through the Old Testament, you're gonna realize really quickly that Israel continues to be unfaithful. She continues to break her end of that mm -hmm. promise covenant. But God doesn't just reach out to her and draw her near again and again. Of course he does that, but he doesn't stop there. And I love that because he offers us a new covenant, not just to Israel, but to us sitting here today, a new covenant in the name of Jesus and the blood of his son, how precious. Yeah, in 2 Timothy, it says that, you know, if, if we're unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. He's got a character which basically defines what faithfulness is and makes it so that the vows that he's made are very clear, very um, holding. They, they, they're steadfast, and that's what we're to model. I don't know what your vows look like on your wedding day, Jennifer. Maybe you wrote your own. We kind of went with the standard, you know, I, Tracy, take you, David to be your wedded wife, to you know, have and to hold, for rich or for poor, I pledge my faithfulness, all those things. No matter what those vows look like, no one has ever upheld their end of the bargain perfectly, mm -hmm. ever. But when we see our spouse breaking one of those, we feel justified in walking out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's when we need to turn back to the gospel 
and turn back to Jesus because he models for us a complete acceptance of us despite our failures. In fact, in Romans, it says that while we were still sinners, that's when he loved us the most. He didn't wait till we got it all cleaned up. And I'm so grateful to serve God like that in a marriage like this underneath his covering. It's such a blessing. If you didn't have a relationship with God when you said your vows, now might be the time to make some new vows between you and God first and then between you and your spouse. Vows that say, when you mess up, because I know you're going to, because you're a sinner, I'm gonna lean into that relationship now. I'm not gonna back away, start pulling away slowly, or even just like that, I'm out of here. I'm gonna lean into you and say, how can I be your encourager? How can I help you in this? Let's go on this road together. And we can also do like Psalm 116 said that David read earlier, we can keep our vows in the presence of the Lord and in the presence of the people because there's people watching, whether it be someone in your own family, maybe even your spouse is watching how you're gonna respond. Mm. I've learned so much from David on how God loves me by his love towards me. And then those people that are watching, we can show them there's hope for them too because we serve this God who keeps his covenant to us. You're causing me to think back to the times that I have been not so great to my husband. It's been more than once, but then to, to hear that forgiveness, you know, yeah. to know that I know you had a bad moment. You responded badly, but mm -hmm. I still love you, and that's not going to yeah, change things. Definitely. David and Tracy Sellers with Vows to Keep. Check out their website, VowsToKeep.com. If your marriage is in any situation that you just think, oh, I just don't know what the future is, well, that phone call to their ministry could be the life-changing, saving situation that you will never, I promise, never regret. Vows to Keep, developing biblically healthy marriages. There you can see their contact information right there on the screen. More from Vows to Keep to come in the coming weeks. Donate your car, boat, motorcycle, or mower to the TV44 auction. You'll benefit from a tax deduction, but more importantly, you'll be part of the ministry of TV44. Call today to find out more. Well, it's very likely that your church supports many missionaries around the world, and possibly you've met them. But have you ever wondered what it's like to be in their shoes, to actually pack up, to go, to go to another location that God is sending and then spread the gospel. We're gonna introduce you to a family who did just that, the Hall family, missionaries to Albania. Thanks for taking some time to stop here in Lima, Ohio, as you are here on furlough. Let's just jump right in and tell me a little bit about your ministry in Albania. Well, we started uh, about two years ago and we helped to establish a private school, the first private school in the area of Albania where we are, which is the Northern Mountain region, which is pretty isolated from from the more, uh, the big city of the capital. And so we spent two years working on that, on establishing that school. And, and now we're transitioning into working directly with the church to help with the more of the discipleship process and uh, reaching out to the community there. Don, what are some of the needs that you recognize exist among the people in Albania? The country of Albania was under communism for what, 50 plus years, very strict. And one of the things that we, it's a very top down a mentality. They're used to being told what to do by the person in authority and doing it. And I had a young woman say to me a couple weeks ago, you know, I'm valuable as an, as an individual. I have opinions. And they're not used to being treated with dignity and worth. And that's, and that's huge for them, that whole uh, being part of a team and not just having to do what they're told because who knows what might happen if they don't. Mission work um, for us in the United States who don't go who aren't a part mm -hmm. of it it can be easier for us to just think well you just go over there and you spend every day telling people about <laughs> jesus and that's what you do and it all works out or even if it doesn't work out <laughs> it does in the end but god's plan sometimes is a little different um, no. sharing the gospel isn't it, it has a different ways that it presents yeah. itself is sure, that correct sure, that's true yeah we we found it's it's uh never exactly what you expect. <laughs> We've heard that from many others and we experienced the same ourselves. Um, but uh, yes, it's definitely the, the daily living that we just do what we do as people first. And that's different in many ways than they live there. But uh, it's, it's a lot of work just to live in a, in a foreign culture. And so, yeah, we're not on the streets preaching the gospel every day. We're, we're meeting people, developing relationships, and uh, uh, teaching children, and uh, getting the, in ourselves in a position where we can 
and share the gospel. Now there are couples who, you know, the moment they get married, they know they're going to be on the mission field. And I think, Don, you did grow up in the mm -hmm, mission field mm -hmm. somewhat, yeah. but uh, you guys were here in the United States, established in mm -hmm. the United States, yeah. six kids. Mm -hmm. But then just a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. God said, go. Right. You are an established yeah. family. You've got adult children. You've got young children. And you basically sold everything. So before we get talking about that, I want you at home to think, you know, if God, if you think God's calling you to something, but you are just not sure, how could I do this? This is crazy. Um, this is going to totally change my whole life, upset all the apples in the cart. But when God is saying go, you've got to go. And that's what you experienced a few years ago. Right. Take us back to that point. Well, we had um, both been teachers in Christian schools, and I was a t uh, Christian school administrator for eight years as well. Um, but uh, for the previous seven years, I was working in the financial world, financial planning with, uh, for personal finance, and had met a client who was a successful businessman who uh, we had some business to take care of, and he was pretty you know, business-like, I guess, about that. And then when we finished that, he said, but let me tell you what really excites me. And he lit up, and he got his cell phone out and started showing me pictures of many of the projects that they had been involved in. Um, and in China, Bulgaria, Albania, and others in mostly short-term missions. And he shared a need they were, were looking at to start a Christian school, or at least a private school in this region of Albania, and wanted a couple who had experience in both education and administration and to go over there and to help start this school. Now, he had no idea that that, that was us, or at least could be us because we had experience in education. He only knew me as his financial advisor. So I was feeling the kind of, maybe, maybe it's you, Dan, maybe it's you, and, uh, and told Don about it. And we talked and prayed and then went back to him and said, by the way, and shared a little bit of our background. So we visited with them for a couple of days and talked and talked and talked about possibilities and then went to visit Albania for about a week to check out this little town in the mountains of Peshkopi, Albania. And uh, God really spoke to us in the sense that we prayed, please show us clearly either yes or absolutely <laughs> no. And a little selfish prayer because we want God's guidance to be clear. But it became very clear that this is what we were supposed to do. So, How was that for you, Don? I mean, you, you sold your possessions. Mm -hmm. You didn't sell your house, but you sold your possessions mm -hmm. and you prepared to leave your four adult children, <laughs> one just graduating from high school here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, when he first called and told me about this, I was like, this is crazy. We were, I was, we were running a homeschool athletic association. We were gearing up for basketball season. I was like, we don't have time for this. And it wasn't like we had, we were looking to see where is God going to send us on the mission field. We, it wasn't that at all. But I could tell that it was really God particularly working on his heart. And it just seemed like it was the right thing. There was just thing after thing that happened. Our adult kids were very supportive of it. They're like, of course, you should go if that's what God wants you to do. Um, our younger kids were not adverse to it, which kind of surprised us. Our son Isaac especially, we thought maybe he would say, what do I want to do that for? But he kind of saw it as an adventure. Um, oh, just little things like, you know, as a mom, you worry about your kids. And as Americans, you know, our, teeth, our kids' teeth need to be straight. And Elizabeth needed orthodontic work. But the the receptionist at the orthodontic office, when we went to consult, she said, you know what, Dawn, if God's calling you to do this, you need to do it. It doesn't matter if your daughter's teeth are straight. This is from an American <laughs> orthodontist, you know? And so there were just little things along the way that just reminded us, and as we said, in the scope of God's kingdom, as Americans, we get concerned about things that really don't matter. If one person comes to know the Lord and have eternal life, it, it's worth it. And so it was a gradual process. Um, it was neat to be able to give, transfer our things to people in the U.S. that they could bless, you know, educational materials to families I knew were on a tight budget. And so to, to be able to give them something at a good cost. And um, actually, when we go back home and visit, we visit our stuff too, because uh -huh. our friends have different pieces of furniture that they bought from us. And so it's kind of neat too. So you're now over two years in, right. you're home for a short period of time, mm -hmm. you're visiting children, but then you're heading back. Yes. Mm -hmm. you're, you're still on this mission that God has called yeah. you to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
And how are you feeling about that at this point? <laughs> well, it's, uh, we're in a bit of a transition right now going from the school to working directly with the church. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, unanswered questions. And so we're sort of reestablishing our role right now, uh, which is very exciting because we'll be working much more directly now with uh, adults and families that the church connects with and, uh, and getting a chance to do more teaching of, of in a church setting rather than only in an academic yeah. setting. So looking forward to that. Kind of, we're excited. It's, it seems like every time we turn around these days, God has a new thing he's right. having us walk into. Maybe every two years, I don't know. That's what it appears to be. But. Well, and, and many people have told us that, you know, we have our plans, but then God sometimes has something else. And it's mm. kind of exciting to see what God's doing. It maybe isn't anything that we even dreamed about. He just had to get us there, and now he'll figure out what he wants us to do there for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so recognizing you're in a period of time where God has called you to Albania. Mm -hmm. Other people aren't necessarily called to Albania, right. but God's called everybody somewhere. Right. And saying yes to that can be fearful, especially mm -hmm. if it involves, like you said, changing your family dynamic, mm -hmm. all of these elements. What would you say to people at home if they're sitting there saying, I, I know God wants me to do this next thing, but I'm scared or I'm, right. I don't know what to do. What kind of encouragement can you give them? Well, we spoke at a church uh, briefly, uh, one that's uh, supportive of us. And it came to me as I was about to go up and say something mm -hmm. to say, you know, it's really good to be here. And it's also really good to be in Albania. It's really good to be where God has you. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a sense if you have that, um, that calling on your life to be where God wants you to be. Yeah, there's going to be apprehension, maybe even a little fear, but um, God provides both the emotional energy and, and uh, confidence that he, to do what he's called you to do. And we've seen that over and over, moving originally from California to Missouri, Missouri to Albania. You know, it's, that's like three different countries, kind of. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's been challenging at times, but uh, he provides. And we're, we're encouraging of people to be confident where you are, where God has you, but be open to being called somewhere else. Well, finally, how can we be supporting you? How can we pray for you? Do you collect, do you raise support? What can we do for you? Well, do uh, you want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've been very blessed financially. One of the advantages to going to the mission field as older people is that we have a pretty broad network of friends and family. And so it's really actually kind of exciting to watch how God's um, raised financial support for us and other support, but from a real variety of people. Um, many of the people that are supporting us are not people that we would have said, oh, we should contact them. They'll give us money. Um, people that we knew, but never in a hundred years would have dreamed that they would have su supported us financially. So uh, we work through an organization called Perception Funding, um, which is, is a neat organization because it serves missionaries. It's a ministry that serves missionaries and other nonprofits and things like that to help them raise money. And to see uh, fundraising as part of mission, not just some ugly thing we have to do, but that's part of it. And I, I think that's true. People in the U.S., not everybody can go. That's not what God's called all of us to do. But um, people can sometimes give financially, and if they can't, they can pray. Um, it is tremendously encouraging to know that people know us and are praying for us. We went to this church and Dan spoke, and afterwards I said, you didn't even introduce us and in what we're doing. And only about half the people know us, you know, you, we kinda, you kind of forget that. And afterwards we are talking to a young man who we didn't know, and he goes, oh, everybody knows who you are and what you're, we're doing because we pray for you. Mm -hmm. That is Means so encouraging, you know, and of course they're not going to know us intimately, but just that showed us they really are praying for us. They're naming us by name. They're talking about at least generally what we're doing. So uh, of, always, of course, finances, but prayer and encouragement like that are, mean a lot. All right. Thank you very much, Dan and Don Hall. Missionaries to Albania, thank you for sharing your story here on TV44's Faith and Friends. You're welcome. Thanks for I encourage you to add Dan and Don and their children, Isaac and Elizabeth, to your prayer list. Be praying for them regularly. They are serving God in Albania. They are reaching a people group who need to feel that loving relationship that only Jesus can provide. Pray for the opportunities, the open doors that they have to form those relationships and that they continue to stand on the path that God has for them. And if you'd like to find out more on how to support them or just how to connect with them, you can always call us here at TV44 to ask for me and I'll make sure that we make those connections for you. Thank you, Jennifer. The Hall family is now safely back in Albania working with churches in that area. And we're out of time on this edition of Faith and Friends. We leave you now with 
one final reminder of what God desires of us from Micah chapter 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I'm praying for you this week that you are doing just that and walking humbly with your God. Have a great week.